requires teacher training. So, okay, someone, so we are being recorded. I should have started recording before, but that's not a problem. Uh, so as I was saying, with very few of our um, most uh, reached for course books providing clear information or practical activities on it, teachers frequently find themselves without a clear understanding of what it is and how it should be taught. So if that describes you, come along to this uh, afternoon here with Lucy. Bring all your unanswered questions and um, it's time to ask the expert. Uh, Lucy Pickering is a professor in applied linguistics and director of the graduate program in applied uh, linguistics TESOL and applied linguistics laboratory at Texas A&M University Commerce. Her presentation today draws from her book, Discourse Intonation, a discourse pragmatic approach to teaching the pronunciation of English um, from Michigan Press. And Lucy, over to you. We are so excited to have you here. So thankful to have you here. This is going to be the perfect way for us to, to end 2021. And over to you. Hey, thanks, Taylor. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, let me focus on just sharing the screen first. <laughs> Uh, making sure, yep, share sound, share screen. Um, Taylor, is that being shared? Great. Yes, I, I'm not sure it's in presentation mode because we can see your, your notes as well. Oh, no, that's not good. Uh, yeah. And before we get this sorted out, just remember everyone that we are going to have our uh, workshop with Lucy starting at 3.15 um, UK time. Registration closes five minutes before the workshop, so you still have time. Um, I'm going to paste the link here on the chat box right now in case you haven't registered yet. Uh, remember to log in or create a guest account uh, before trying to register if you haven't yet. Um, so just go there and click on login at the top of the IATAPA website. And if you have any uh, issues with the registration, please let us know here, all the Pramsey crew. Um, to attend this workshop, it's five pounds. Or if you're an, an IATAPA member, it's 350. But if you're a Pramsey member, it's free for all members. And they received an email uh, recently with a special code enabling free registration. Uh, so we really hope that everyone who's here in the Ask the Expert session is also able to join us for um, the workshop. And um, I think that's it. How are looking Let now, me... Taylor? Did you, Perfect. Did you still see all my notes? No? Yes. Presentation modes, no notes. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, um, I am going to try and simultaneously keep my chat open so that I can um, see everything that's going on. But I have asked Taylor to moderate to um, uh, in case I don't see what's going on, which is also entirely possible. So um, uh, thank you for coming by and um, thank you very much for Pronsig for asking me to do this. I'm absolutely delighted to, um, I was saying that I came to, I'm originally from London, but I came to IHF for, gosh, um, in the late 90s with Richard Caldwell a long time ago and, um, and I haven't managed to get back to the conference since. So I'm absolutely delighted to be um, doing this today. So um, I'm just going to talk for 10 minutes about what intonation is um, or, or, you know, just a general sort of overview. And then, um, yeah, I'm just delighted to, to take any questions that come up. So um, this obviously is uh, want to go for a ride versus 
want to go for a ride um, and trying to decide whether uh, the dog's trying to decide whether they're going to the vet or um, going for a walk. Um, so let's do, um, basically I'm going to do a very broad definition of intonation, which I call the three Ps. So prominence, which is utterance stress, um, pitch, which is melody, so rises and fall, falls in um, pitch, and um, pause, so creation of speech units in a speech stream. You know, we have one long speech stream and somehow you've got to divide that up. So um, we'll come back to looking at three Ps in a second. But first, I wanted to talk about why you might, why we might think about teaching intonation and why it is important. Um, and it's because it's a surface feature that is in our speech and that people respond to automatically. It's something that you're not even aware that you're really responding to. But in um, we know that babies respond to their mother's prosody in utero. So this is a, a very tacit and emotional response that you might have to someone's intonation um, and prosodic speech in, in, in the prosody of their speech. And that forms part of what's um, been called impression management, which is you know how you come across to the people that you talk to, whether you come across as friendly or as unfriendly or as um, kind um, or as understanding, um, relatable and so on. Um, so it's one of those, one of those things. And what we know is at the bottom of all of that <laughs> comes, um, especially if you're a, uh, a non-native speaker in a native speaker environment. So living, you're a non-native speaker living in England or certainly living in America. Um, it can have uh, consequences for whether you have equal access um, to everything or whether you're um, being penalized in some way um, with a linguistic penalty because people are listening to you and making judgments about you um, that, that you're not even aware is happening. So the linguistic penalty is the result of hidden difficulties or interpretations so things that are happening in what we call below the waterline so you're not your the listener isn't even necessarily aware they might be aware that they're getting annoyed they might be aware that they're thinking why is this person angry with me but they're not aware that what they're responding to is these um, prosodic choices so Ilka Menon said given that we derive much of our impressions about speakers attitude and disposition toward us from the way they use intonation in speech <clears throat> listeners may form a negative impression of a speaker based on a constant inappropriate use of intonation so I think, you know, if we, we take all that, um, and I think all that is very true, um, then we say, well, what, what does, in, how does intonation contribute to that? Um, so it can be anything from the very benign to the highly disruptive, essentially. So um, here's a benign example from one of my students. This is, uh, one of my students who said, uh, many times my husband, a native Spanish speaker has said, where's your car? I asked him as opposed to who else's because we'd come together in mine. And he asked me what I was talking about. And I told him that the way he said it sounded weird. I had tacit knowledge of intonation, but I couldn't verbalize the rules. I told him he should stay instead. Where's your car? So this was after we had done some work in the classroom on provenance. She was like, oh, now I, I, I knew what was wrong, but I didn't know how to, how to explain it. So benign in the sense that as far as I know, they're still happily married and no big deal. Um, but it can obviously go to uh, highly disruptive um, if people are misunderstanding a use of prosody. So this is not the greatest sound file, but I wanted to show you um, what a mismatch in prosody might look like. Um, what you see here is the volume, and what you see here is the pitch line. 
So this is the volume of the first speaker, and this is the pitch line of the first speaker. Then this is the volume of the second speaker and the pitch line of the second speaker. And you can see that these are wildly mismatched, right? So you've got um, speaker number one says, so you like grammar? And speaker number two says, no, 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 no. So now over and above the fact that the lexical choice isn't great, we rarely say no, no, no to another adult, to children and animals, but not to another adult. Um, in addition, what's happening is the mismatch in prosody is making it sound, the disagreement sound super emphatic and unnecessarily emphatic, which people could interpret as you being um, angry with them. So let's have a listen to that. She says. Uh, about grammar? Yeah. Yeah, grammar. I don't, I don't like grammar. Really? You like grammar? No, 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 no. So, as I said, not the greatest sound file, but I think the point is made that the mismatch is is there. So let's go back to oh, let's go back to where do I start, right? If I if I if I if I buy all of this, which I hope you do, um, where am I going to look for um, help in teaching it? And this is where I go back to these three P's, and I think. In addition to a lack of training um, in many training teacher training programs, we also, as a field, haven't done a great job in um, materials development and, and understanding how prosody works and then providing the right kinds of materials to teachers and students in order to, to help them. So the first one is um, prominence, so utterance level stress. And typically um, we are told, you know, uh, stress content words don't stress function words, right? Um, but the typical learner error is in fact to stress too many words inside a unit. So instead of just keeping the, the focus on the tonic syllable, for example, actually stressing all the content words. So, Having materials that give pieces of advice like stress content words, don't stress function words is actually sort of creating even more of a teacher induced error, if you like, it's um, creating more problems than it's helping. So a better approach is to use discourse examples, real authentic examples to show how um, prominence in fact reflects information structure. This is a very straightforward example where um, the stress in the first one is on money um, because money is the new information. And then the prominent stress shifts to much because um, money is now old information and the important information is how much money. So let's have a listen to that. I need to borrow some money. How much money? Right. And we can hear that this is how strange it sounds if we don't do that. If we just use the same stress in both and, and stress the last um, uh, content word still on money, even though this is now old information, you can hear that it doesn't sound right. I need to borrow some money. How much money? Right. So um, very straightforward, very simple example, but something that shows your students that um, it's not uh, necessarily the final noun. It, it totally depends on the information structure. In English, often now, more than, more than often, our new information is at the end. But of course, in this case, um, you've changed. So let's talk about pitch real fast. Um, Pitch is, uh, in this case, um, we're talking about the rises and falls, usually on the tonic syllable at the end. And the traditional approach to doing this has been uh, syntax and uh, affect, right? So syntax would be um, WH questions go down, yes, no questions go up, 
right? Um, so this is a standard thing that we're we're told and, and appears in materials. Unfortunately, it's not true. And um, corpus research shows us that that often 50% in 50% of cases, it's not true. WH questions can go up or down. And yes and no questions can go up or down because it's not based in the syntax, it's based in the pragmatics. So the other way that we're often talked discussed is through affect. I don't know how many of you are as um, ancient as me, but I remember back in the day we had uh, O'Connor and Arnold's uh, uh, 300 tunes, you know, of, um, you know, go uh, four, three, one, and it's like happy, but puzzled or, um, you know, sad and maybe bewildered. You know, you've got 300 contours that learners are supposed to know, which is obviously um, an impossibility. Plus, we also know that affect is um, uh, communicated by non a bunch of other things in addition to the intonation, nonverbals, and and so on. So, a typical learner error that we find at the sort of intermediate level is um, overusing of falling and level tones, and this can often um, make them sound either monotonous or kind of bored and not interested. So um, one thing that we wanna do is think about the ways in which pitch um, prioritizes relationship building, right? So in this case, there's no sound file, but I'll do it for you. This is a typical example of something we, that's called a yes, but strategy. So, um, I don't know if Dune has made it over to you guys yet, but it's um, awesome. And I was watching it and um, I thought it was great. So here would be a typical, I thought the movie was great, right? And then B says, um, well, so just from that, if we think does B probably agree or disagree with A, I think we would all agree that B probably disagrees with A. and. The way we know that is by this choice of intonation structure that basically signals to the person, uh-oh, something's not, if they agree with me, they'd say, yeah, it was so good. But in fact, because they're using these intonation and um, short adverbial choices, we know that's not the case. Um, this is something that's called, um, short tokens, long prosody, meaning it doesn't really matter whether it's an um or a well or a, the, the choice of the sound, the, the prosodic choice itself is what's communicating that message. Um, here's a second example. This is an IRF exchange, for example, between a teacher and a student. So um, in a chemistry class, so if the flame turns purple, what chemical is that? The student says sodium and the teacher says no it's not sodium okay or the teacher might say sodium now i would argue um, that the teacher is more likely particularly in an adult classroom to say sodium because it communicates uh, probably not. I mean, again, you've got that signal. Um, if if it was sodium, the teacher would have said yes, right, or good. So, but it do doesn't say no. It's not sodium, right? <laughs> With that falling um, tone, it it um, communicates that the person is wrong without saying um, you're wrong. With a with that strong falling tone. So the last one, the last P is pause, which is a um, uh, uh, tone unit structure. So it's sometimes called intonation groups, focus groups. Um, and there isn't really a traditional approach to how we um, look at uh, tone units and intonation. And a lot of that is because intonation was typically approached from a sentential level. So you're only looking at one or maybe two units at a time. So pausing wasn't really um, something that you looked at because it only becomes really um, overt in a, a discourse context. 
So a typical learner error we find in uh, intermediates is erratic pause patterns with highly variable pause placement and lengths that break up melodic contours. So an approach that is better than looking at sentential level um, intonation is working with different discourse genres to improve spoken fluency. And of course, now we, we have the world um, available to us in terms of spoken discourse choices on MP3 files and so on. Um, you can, it's just a matter of curating the material, but you can find anything you want. Uh, from uh, this example, I, uh, the first one is a, um, a speech by Princess Diana from a long time ago. Um, and this is of course a um, speech that she gave. So um, she was very careful, very slow, very considered in how she um, speaks, where do we begin? From those I have spoken to through my work at Turning Point, the beginning seems to be that women in our society are seen as the carers. Whatever life throws at them, they will always cope. Very measured um, kind of speech versus this one uh, is more of a conversational um, kind of speech units are much longer, usually can be very fast. Um, this is in fact my niece. So this is in addition to um, being conversational, teenage conversational, and went something like, uh, so totally the best vacation I ever went on was to Disney World when we were like six or seven and all of us went, you know, like Coco, Ali, Kieran, you know, Kathy's kids. It's the only time mom paid for the Disney hotel. So we were right there like a boat ride away, like we were, but not Kathy and her kids, you know. So very, um, uh, this is quite significant for, for international students who are going to be teaching assistants, for example, here in the States, because this is essentially how undergraduate students speak most of the time. Um, so that's just a brief, sort of idea of how you can um, approach some of these um, issues and a, a very sort of um, straightforward way um, using the three P's approach. Um, these comments were things, this was one of my students, a learner who, who wrote to me I feel when I asked about um, their experience, I feel though my entire language learning experience has been one punctuated by uncomfortable interactions caused in part by different norms in intonation and stress and nonverbal communication. So um, some people are very aware that, that, that they've, there's a gap between what they've learned or what they're learning and what's happening to them in the real world. And this is from one of my teachers. Um, uh, all these years I've been teaching various things and to actually get a term as simple as the word prominence, which I probably should have known but had never come across before. So for me, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And of course that's lovely to hear a teacher say, well, of course, this is a very straightforward notion. I just haven't been able to put my finger on it before now because I haven't done any, any of that training. So um, I will close with a shameless plug um, for my book, which you can get on Amazon. And um, uh, thank you very much for listening. I will, I'm going to stop my sharing, Taylor. And now I can see 30 new messages. Okay, okay. Yeah, we have some questions that are going on. Um, I think the very first would be a very technical question from, from Beata, our own tech guru from Pramsig. Um, Lucy, the first program, uh, like the, the screenshot from a, a software that you showed us, uh, which yeah. one was that? Because it doesn't uh, look like Pratt. So she no. was curious and now so am I. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So this is actually um, a from a computerized speech lab by K Elemetrics. So 
this is one of the, it's not freeware. And that's, I think, one of the reasons, this is the reason I love it. I started using it in the 1990s because the lab that I was working at in the University of Florida had it. So um, that's why it looks so good compared to your average Pratt output where you have all those up lines and down lines. This, um, the CSO is a dedicated device. It was initially um, designed for um, speech communication disorders. So it, it um, has volume, pitch, everything that you want, but because it's dedicated, it's about, um, then it was about $8,000. Now it's probably about $12,000, so about 10,000 pounds. But I think you can get, um, it's a hardware software mix, but I think you can actually now just get the software to go inside your computer. So, but it's not freeware. So that's the difference between Wasp and Pratt and the CSL. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, we have a question from Abreze. He's asking, sorry, I'm assuming it's a he. I don't, I don't know. They're asking, what areas would you focus on when teaching exam classes? Teaching what classes, I'm sorry? Exam classes. Exam classes. Uh, ah, teaching exam classes. Well, so I guess it, it depends, right? It would depend on the exam. But um, if, uh, if you're talking about something like the oral proficiency exam, then um, uh, a couple of things are very important. One would be the use of the speech speech stream. So making sure that your uh, pauses, unlike mine currently, are coherent. And in a so you you've got a um, a coherent speech stream for your listener. And the other thing I would think about very strongly is is this relationship building function. Um, nothing kind of stops an interaction or a conversation like um, somebody saying, uh-huh, or yes, I think so. Um, then the other person has to do all the work. So if it's something like the um, oral interview proficiency exam, you want to, to be sounding like you're taking some of that work off of your interlocutor. So. Um, relationship building functions of intonation are very important for that kind of design. I see. Um, we have another question from Bianca and she asks, is there a specific stage where intonation can best be integrated? Oh, that's an excellent question. And my, my view very strongly is right at the get-go. Yeah, um, you can do Right from the very beginning, you can do um, very small interactions like that. Um, uh, can I borrow some money? How much money, right? So you can include um, prominence characteristics super early. You, do, you don't need, all you need is a piece of discourse. That's, that's the issue for teaching intonation. All you need is a piece of discourse. And that piece of discourse can be, can be two people, so it can be two lines in text, or it can be um, four or five sentences, right? But that's all you need, right? Um, so you can do it almost right from the very beginning. Um, you can have a tiny narrative text of four or five lines, and you can do it because the information structure will change in that in that narrative in much the same way as we looked at with the much and the money. So right from the beginning, I say, yeah, with discourse intonation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, we have a question from Akihiro and they ask, uh, when we want to acoustically analyze spontaneous speech, it's not always easy to decide which word or syllable receives prominence. It is often the case that pitch movement is not as outstanding as expected in something like this. If the speech is prepared or carefully read, it's not a problem, but well, I, I think they, they are tackling here the whole issue of uh, when that comes to like spontaneous speech, right? Uh -huh. And teaching and that to our students. 
Yes, and it's at, that's absolutely correct. And that's why at the beginning, I said for prominence, I'm not going to try and reshare my screen again, but um, um, Taylor's going to make that PDF yeah. um, available for you, I think. So um, I said it could be louder, longer, or higher. Now, typically, we're told it's higher, right? So that can be one of the problems because often it's not necessarily that much higher, but it's more salient. So it's longer or it's louder. So your perception is as a native speaker hearer, your perception is this is being made prominent and made salient. And so it's, this is why I always say, it's very tricky to do this through machine um, analysis. I do all my intonation analysis by hand. So do my students because you the if you if you just ask it to say, okay, I'm looking for a pitch excursion of X, you know, um, fundamental frequency uh, frequency to, or or Y, then um, a, sometimes the excursion goes down instead of going up, but also sometimes the excursion, the pitch excursion is, is not the most salient um, aspect of that prominence. It could be that it's louder. You are still gonna perceive that as a prominent syllable, even though it's not necessarily higher. So you're absolutely right when you say, um, that it's um, uh, difficult to acoustically analyze this if you just take one um, uh, parameter. What you're actually looking for is more than one parameter um, to do it. So I, I, I think it, it you know, um, you can work um, on the most salient speech first. If you take, for example, something like Princess Diana, her prominence is a pretty, you know, in, in her in her speeches, or I've also used speeches by Barack Obama. Um, the prominences are very clear. So if you start with that kind of discourse genre, and then move yourself slowly into the more tricky ones, like you say, in conversation and so on, you'll, the, the more you do it, the better the better you and your students get at it. I can promise you that. Awesome. Uh, Veronica here, uh, she asks, would falling intonation in the case of, hmm, well, also mean that the person disagrees? It seems to me that could be the case as well. I think here we were talking about the example of uh, uh, sodium. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you, it, it, it depends on, um, in, in that case, the sodium, you could say it any way you want. This, this is one of the reasons why when we're, when we're told, you know, look at the syntax, it's so confusing because it's not, doesn't rest in the syntax. You can say, the teacher could say, huh, sodium, right? Um, or the teacher can say, hmm, sodium. <laughs> the, the question is, what, is the pragmatic effect of choosing one versus another, right? And when all the research that, that I've done since, my, since the mid nineties in classroom discourse, particularly adult classroom discourse, and this can be a big difference between a children's classroom where adults are literally telling children off, you know, what to do and what not to do, um, versus an adult classroom. One thing that was very salient about tone choices was there was a lot more rising tone choices in the teaching discourse of um, native speakers with other adults. And um, it was a sort of convergence kind of measure. It was a way of saying, um, I, creating a common ground. You think it's sodium, it, it isn't sodium, you're wrong, but I'm not going to blatantly say sodium, huh? You know, which clearly signals 
that's wrong, right? But I'm gonna signal it in a way that increases our common ground and um, contributes to the relationship building. So give you an opportunity to re-say that without making it obvious that um, in my intonation choices that you're wrong. So what this raises is a very good point actually is what's being raised, which is who says you have to say it one way or the other? And the answer is, there is no one that says you have to do it one way or the other. It's entirely possible for you to do it both ways. The question is, overall, what does the pragmatic effect? So if you have a teacher who's constantly using falling um, tones, that has an effect, a pragmatic effect in their spoken discourse, and it can be very distancing for, um, it's the same if, if someone's giving a speech, for example, if someone's reading aloud and they're giving a speech and they're not really focused on their audience, then you know, it can be a very off-putting, distancing um, kind of, but, but, but it's not wrong. You know, these are norms, they're not, um, they're not rules in that sense. That's a very, it's a very good question, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ruby asks, what do you think of the importance of attitudinal intonational, intonation? Ah, so um, good, yes. I mean, I was a bit cavalier about the O'Connor and Arnold 300 tunes, Ruby, I agree. Um, or, you know, what we would say is, as, as part of discourse intonation is that disc, um, intonation has multiple functions. So it has um, a grammatical function in some cases, it has an attitudinal function in some cases, it has an informational function, it has a sociolinguistic function. So it has multiple, multiple functions and attitude is, is part of that function. I think the, the problem is that we have made that a priority so we have have taken one piece of the system and said oh look this is what intonation does it it creates these different kinds of attitudes but in fact um that's just one of the multiple functions it has when it's based inside pragmatics and discourse so if you try and say i mean there's a there's a part I did a long time ago where, where there's a, a Halladayan attitude thing where he says, oh, it's a fire engine. And, and he's like, so this is this kind of leap excursion in pitch is what creates the attitude. But, but if you don't say, oh, it's a fire engine, if you say something completely like um, um, innocuous, like, do you want a panini? Oh, you want a panini? Then, then it, it, it doesn't doesn't compute this sort of, um, oh gosh, fabulous excitement. So it depends on the text that, that goes with it. So when you're thinking of attitude and intonation, you want to consider it inside all these other aspects as well and not say, not pull it out and say, um, what intonation does is convey attitude and depends if you use this tone or that tone, because what you'll find is that that doesn't work. But yes, it absolutely is a component. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, our very own Gemma, uh, she asks, do you find that students are sometimes resistant or embarrassed to include more stress in their speech, specifically the use of page, page contours I feel like I spend a lot of time reassuring students it's okay, and especially male students who think it's a feature of female speech only. Yeah, the fragile masculinity we all had to deal with, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, yes. Okay, so we're going to say yes one more time. Um, there is, and of course, that's one of the reasons why one. Uh, um, some popular methods of introducing prosody um, use sort of drama-based um, techniques, excuse me. So to, um, so things like raise your voice to the top, oh, to, try and, to try and sort of get them used to this idea. Um, it's also true that uh, 
non-native speaker speech in general, all the research shows that it has a, um, a, a smaller pitch range than native speaker discourse. Now, this could be for a number of reasons, but um, so for example, there can be variation in pitch ranges between languages for a start. But generally speaking, what, what most people would say is there's a lack of confidence and that um, in uh, non-native speaker speech in general, that can cause this muffling effect where they don't open their mouth as much as you'd want them to, you know, and drop your jaw to get your vowels right. So it's a component of that. So I think, yes, um, and the way I've done that is to use things like the CSL, but you can also use WASP or Pratt to um, model speech. So um, the, you can have a, a dual screen, so you can have someone model what it would look like, what the pitch excursion or the volume excursion would look like, and then have the student try to model that contour to show them that it's, um, you know, and I don't, I would use male, male, if you see what I mean. And um, um, so that they're not trying, they did realize they're not, I'm not trying to make them model my pitch line. I'm there, they're, but they're still modeling um, a pitch range that's appropriate for them. So um, I've had some success with that. Yeah. Very nice. Um, we have actually a comment from Veronica. Thank you, Lucy. This is a fab presentation, very clear, comprehensive. Uh, and the book is great. I've included it in my syllabus because I've worked with Brazil uh, itself for years and it's not easy at grad level. Yes, I, I tend to agree, Brazil is definitely not easy at grad level. Uh, Bianca here, she asks, do you recommend any websites which would uh, help us teach intonation in our classes? And a wonderful thing here is that our community has already started recommending lots of things uh, here. Uh, Beata mentioned uh, English uh, speech services, uh, speech, uh, speechandhearing.net. Um, so interesting yeah. things here, but would you add any? Well, these are great. Um, thank you, Bianca, they're, they're, they're great. I would also say, honestly, you don't even need these kinds of, um, you, you can use, this is great. This is obviously prepared, curated pedagogical material. So you don't have to curate it yourself. But needless to say, if you were willing to curate and had time to curate it yourself, it's all over, right? It's all around you. Um, I don't know how popular this this film was in, uh, and I forget the name. Oh, it's the name is Dude, Where Is My Car? Um, is the name of the movie, and um, uh, there's a whole um, interaction between two characters in this movie where he's like, "Dude, dude, dude, dude," and they're having this entire conversation just using the word "dude." Um, there is just tons of material out there that you can use to um, curate your own pedagogical materials based on whatever it is that you're interested in, in doing. So for example, prominence, if you're interested in prominence, you might, as I said, pick speeches because they're really good. They're really good for to be able to mark prominence structures. If you're doing tone choices, you might want to pick um, conversation or narrative. They're great places where you can hear uh, rising and falling tones quite, quite easily. You know, so you can curate your own material. The, the thing is to decide what it is that you want to focus on. So um, if you look at the three Ps, um, if you realize that prominence is, is a real problem if a lot of your students are just doing these multiple prominences da, 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 instead of da, 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 then that then you can create your own materials to focus on that. 
I see. Um, we have a comment from Alan, and he says, uh, show them bad examples. Example, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, no tone groups, uh, <laughs> rapid speech, unintelli unintelligible to a non-native speaker. Really? That's so interesting. Yes, great. I, uh, I, I basically have lived in America for nearly 30 years now, so I missed most of Tony Blair. But um, that, yes, I mean, and I think what this, what Alan raises, which is great, is let's have the conversation. You know, don't assume that um, there's a very, very also kind of outdated assumption that students are just going to work this out. That if you mm -hmm. if you have them listen to enough stuff and you have them um, talk enough, that they'll just like spontaneously work these things out which is not necessarily the case right um for some people sure um it's like crashing and reading right for some people he says read 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 some people great for other people no they need some direction on what it is they need to look at and so on so have the conversation um say what's going on what do you hear what are you thinking, you know? And the other thing I like about this example, Alan, is um, the fact that these are not rules, these are norms. So people can do anything they want, um, you know, but there's gonna be a, um, a, a penalty to pay for that, right? So, so they have to decide, you know, and you want your students to, to understand what those penalties may or may not be if if they're not following um, certain norms that we would expect. And I love it that the example was from a native speaker because we kind of debunked yes. this myth that all native speakers are like perfect communicators and unfortunately right. no, that's not And in fact, you can do the opposite too. I don't know if, if any of you know much about John Murphy's work, but he has something called highly intelligible non-native speakers that he uses to do this work. So um, the one that I use with my teachers and students is um, Javier Badem. The, um, the actor from uh, No Country for Old Men, or, or was also just in Dune as well. And, um, and he's fantastic. There's an interview of him in um, being interviewed by Time magazine. And um, his, he has um, some Spanish transfer issues with consonants and so on, but his affect is fantastic, his prominence is fantastic, his intonation choices, you know, he, he comes across as um, completely comprehensible, highly intelligible, extremely likable guy, you know, um, so you can do it that way too, yeah. Yeah, um, it, it just came to my mind, uh, an interview that I was watching the other day with Angelina Jolie and Salma Hayek, and Salma is Mexican, and she's a great communicator, lots of tone groups and really, really good. So really good for, for anyone to use as an example. Yeah. Uh, a very interesting and important question from our very own Christina. I don't feel very confident assessing the pragmatic, the pragmatic effect of tones in particular situations. What can I do? Yeah, that's so, uh, and you know, um, Christina, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, we do have to be very aware when we are native speaker teachers of how much of this we're bringing in with us, you know, and how much, you know, so, so be because I said, you know, this is, um, intonation is something that we know um, that, uh, in utero, babies recognize the prosody of their mothers. Um, we, uh, people recognize children, babies um, recognize the prosody of their own language versus another. So it's so deeply seeded that um, inside of us that we do want to be very aware that when we say to non-native speaker teachers, you know, look, just, just teach intonation, have a, have a go at that, particularly the pragmatic part of it, that their instincts are not the same. Um, it's also true that varieties of English are extremely different. 
So an Indian English speaker, for example, has different instincts about, about all of those three Ps, actually, when you start looking at the, at the language. So we wanna be very aware that, um, uh, that we, we're trying to use material that anyone can work with. So very, you don't want complicated, that's one of the reasons I don't like this 300 tunes, right? Because it, it's too complicated. Um, we can make very simple materials um, using very basic pragmatic um, assumptions. One, for example, with tone choice is that um, rising tones um, are usually more convergent than falling tones. So falling tones tend to be used for new information, for um, telling, so they go with verbs like tell, assert, command, whereas rising uh, tones go more with um, confirm, um, uh, remind, um, you know, so th those kinds of, and a shameless plug, Christina, I have this information in the book, but so, you know, as long as we can um, give uh, learners and non-native speakers who, who do feel that they have less confidence understandably, um, some basic parameters with which to work, I think it, it becomes easier and you will become more confident. The more you do it, the, the more confident you'll become. Yeah, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Great, well, the solid advice. Um, well, um, I don't think we have more questions. Uh, so before we wrap up, let me just once again, share my screen to remind you that we have uh, a workshop with Lucy at 3.15 UK time. We'll still have time to register. So hurry up, please. Uh, registration closes at 3.10 uh, UK time. Uh, this is the link that you should follow. Uh, we're going to paste it in the chat as well. Remember, it's a different link. We, we are not going to use this one from, from this uh, room. We're going to close this room and we're going to open another one. Um, so Lucy, thank you so much for this. It was such a great session. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Thank, thank you, everybody, you. for the questions, too. It was really amazing. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, now we're going to go on a break. Uh, so. If you're fast, you can go grab a cup of coffee, some tea, a sandwich if you're really fast. <laughs> uh, remember to also make sure you follow Ayatapo Kranzweg on social media. Our socials are listed here in the chat. And thank you so much. Hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.